Okay, so welcome back. We have now looked at the basics of dislocation. Now it's time to delve into the stress and strain field, which is what will give us an understanding of how dislocations interact and in have the, how their interplay results in the overall behavior of a material, particularly metals and alloys. So from this point of view, let's start with uh, understanding what is called as Volterra construction. This is very useful from the point of view of understanding the stress and strain field, which will help us get the stress field around a screw dislocation. We will not be deriving the same thing about an edge dislocation because it is a little bit uh, more cumbersome, but nevertheless, I would strongly suggest you to look for similar kind of derivation for the edge dislocation. So in Volterra construction, what we have is that uh, there are two types of defects described about a crystal. One is disclination. Disclination is when there is an angular opening and it's a very different type of defect and is also found in materials, but this is not what we are interested in right now. What we're interested in is dislocations. Here in the terms of Volterra uh, construction, you would see that it results in translation. So translation and that to away from the core because at the very core, you would not be able to define any translation. Okay, so let's say for the purpose of this, we have a cylinder. So it's a material and we cut a cylinder out of it. So it's a single crystal, but it is a cylinder, a hollow cylinder, okay? So this is how it would look like. And let's say that we cut this along one of the sides. So this is now that you can open it. It is now you can uh, two different surfaces over here. Now, the way you open it will, and we are assuming that it is inside a crystal. This is just for the purpose of construction. We have taken it separately but it is happening inside a crystal. Now, the way you translate or rotate, depending on that, you can get different types of dislocations and disclinations. So first, look, let's look at dislocation, which is of our interest, where, the, where the changes take place by translation. So let's say we have this, as the x-axis, this as the y-axis, and this as the z-axis. So if the translation takes place along the y-direction, then this is how it will look like. So there is a gap or opening over here. This represents an edge dislocation. Now, similarly, you can have the translation along X direction, in which case this construction would look like
So this is moved along x direction here. It is moved along y direction. And this also represents an edge dislocation. However, if this translation were to occur, so you can clearly uh, identify it with an edge dislocation. There is a gap over here. It is like missing plane over here. Here again, you can see that this is displaced. So this is like a missing plane over here. So both of these represent edge dislocation. But now when we see the construction, when the translation takes place along Z direction, it will clearly remind you of a screw dislocation. So you can clearly see that if you rotate around this, the layer goes back. And this is how we had defined the screw dislocation. So over here, this represents a screw dislocation. So both of these are edge and this one is screw. And you would, this is the particular construction that you, we would use to derive uh, the strain field around a screw dislocation, which can then help us also get this stress field around the screw dislocation. And this construction has been used by Ashby to explain the stress field around edge dislocation, which I uh, earlier suggested that you can look at it on your own. It's a little bit more complex than what we will look for the screw dislocation, but not very unreachable. So this is for the translation. However, if the opening were made in an angular way, now what do we mean by angular? We will see. So you can have So what do we see here is that there is an angular opening. So the two faces are not parallel. Unlike if you go over here, when it was open, the two faces were parallel. In this case, the two faces are like this. And it has a very different implication or a different effect when you look in terms of the stress and strain fields. So in something we will not discuss, but in disclination, this results in a strain field, which is ever increasing while the strain field around a dislocation where around a dislocation it saturates or it uh, um, it is bound so this is one type of disclination where you have angular opening the other type of disclination can be like this So again, you see the two faces are now twisted. So again, there is an angular nature to this. And in the third one, we can, the third type of disclination can be like this. So here, the two faces are like this. They're opening like a jaw. So that is, uh, these three represent the disclination.
with angular openings. On the other hand, we saw that these three, we have translation which result in dislocations. So these two are in some sense similar, they result in edge dislocation and this one is a little bit different which results in screw dislocation. Okay, so now we understand Voltra construction which can be very useful to understand dislocation. From this, we will use this particular structure and we will show the strain field around screw dislocation. Okay, so, but before that, let's see why there should be a field or a strain field or a stress field around a dislocation. So let's say you have an edge dislocation. So here I am trying to draw an edge dislocation. And here is your edge dislocation. Let me draw it with a different color. Coming back to this color. So clearly you can see that there is an extra half plane on the top, or you can say a mix missing half plane on the bottom, which clearly means that there is little bit extra space over here on the bottom side while on the top side, you have a little tighter packing. And because of this, there should be compression over here. And there should be tension in this. Sorry, this is, yeah, this is right. Because this will be stretched in some sense and therefore there will be tensile forces. And if you were to Later on, when, when we look at the equations, when you draw it, you would see that the stress fields would look like this. So here you will have positive and here negative, assuming this is compression. So negative is representing compression and positive is representing tension and these lines represent contours. So similar stresses. So these are much higher stresses, but in opposite sense. So these, this is how the strain fields and the stress fields look like for edge dislocation. And similarly for screw dislocations, which we will see in the next slide. Okay, so let's say we have we use the construction, Voltra construction, let me just pull these figures a little bit. So you can see that this is translated along Z direction. So this is your Z direction. Let me draw it with a different color. So this is part of the crystal, which is rotated, which is uh, translated by along Z direction. And this amount will always be fixed, which will be equal to Berger's vector because that is how one dislocation is defined, where the shift, if you remember from the Berger circuit, it will be shifted by one unit, which is what we define as the Berger's vector. So this is equal to one B. And let's again say along this cut, we have the X axis and perpendicular to this, we have the Y axis. And let's say we are looking at some point xi comma yi, which is at an angle theta from the x-axis. Now, if I were to unroll it, 
open this because it is cut and so if I opened it, how would it look like? If it were completely uh, no translation had taken place, then this should have looked like this. But now we know that their translation has taken place. So the actual line would look like this. And we know how much it is moved down. This amount is equal to B. And this point is somewhere over here. So if this radius is, it is a very thin cylinder, so we'll assume a constant radius. This radius is R and theta is in radians. Therefore, this is theta R length. And this total length is two pi R. Okay, so now I will have to jump a little bit because I wrote this equation over here. Now, if we, uh, you can go back to our slides and look at how the strains are defined with respect to displacement. So first let's look at what are the values of the displacement. So we'll see that along the X axis, there is zero displacement. Along the Y axis, there is zero displacement. But along the Z axis, when we are talking about this particular point, along this particular line, there is a displacement. And how do we calculate that? This is equal to theta into R by two pi R times B. So basically it is to be proportionate. The at a distance of two pi R, the total displacement is uh, B and at theta R, it should be theta R by two pi R times B. So we know the displacement at this point, which is now equal to B theta by two pi, or we can say that since it is uh, theta, we can write it as B by two pi tan inverse yi by xi. So if you can go back here and see, this is theta, which is tan theta is equal to yi by xi. Therefore, theta is equal to tan inverse yi by xi. Now we know that e xx, if you go back and look at the equation with respect to displacement, you would find that e xx, e y y, e z z, e x y, E, Y, X, all of these will turn out to be zero. However, what will not turn out to be zero are E, X, Z equal to E, Z, X, which is equal to one by two del U, Z by del X plus del U, X by del Z. Over here again, since del U, uh, U X is zero, Therefore, this quantity goes away. What we are left with is only this quantity, which is equal to, so we have to divide, differentiate this uz with respect to x. And what you will get is one by two times two pi, sorry, b by two pi, one over one plus yi square xi square, times yi by xi square. And this will turn out to be, and this is minus sign over here, I missed that. Therefore, it will turn out to be minus b by four pi y by x i square plus yi square. Or in general, you can write minus b by four pi sine theta by r. But this is not the only com component which is not zero. We also have E y z equal to E z y equal to 
वन बाई टू डेल यू जेड बाई डेल वाई प्लस डेल वाई डेल यू वाई बाई डेल जेड सो अगेन डेल यू वाई कॉम्पोनेंट इज जीरो but del u z component is not zero and therefore we differentiate the same equation with respect to y and what you will get in this case by after all the simplification is b by 4 pi cos theta by r now if the strains are very small we know that this engineering this engineering strains can be considered equal to true strains and therefore what we will have is epsilon xz equal to epsilon zx equal to e xz equal to ezx similarly epsilon yz equal to epsilon zy equal to e y z equal to e z y and overall the strain tensor would look like for a screw dislocation so you will have this one zero this one zero here you will have epsilon x z here you will have epsilon y z here you will have epsilon z x epsilon z y zero zero and zero so this translates to this strain tensor for screw dislocation now we also know that sigma ij is equal to 2g which is the shear modulus times epsilon ij and therefore what we get is that sigma xx is equal to sigma yy is equal to sigma zz is equal to sigma xy the components which were this whose corresponding strains were zero their corresponding stresses would also be zero and the corresponding stresses for the non zero Uh, strains come out to y z equal to sigma z y equal to now you will have two into g multiplied with all this so it comes out to two g b by two pi cos theta by r so very simple similarly sigma x z is equal to sigma z x equal to g b by Two pi, and there is a minus sign, sine theta by r. So overall, what we get is a stress tensor which has components similar to the strain components: five zero elements and four non-zero elements. Sigma x z, sigma y z, sigma z x, sigma z y, and zero. defines the stress tensor around screw dislocation okay so this i have also given here in terms of i have already typed it so that there is no mistake or any mistake does not creep into it so you can clearly see this is the strain tensor this is the stress tensor these are the quantities and for these are the quantities for the stress tensor these are the non zero stress tensor quantity and the values are over here for the epsilon and the sigma so this is also epsilon so i did allow one mistake here okay so this is the strains and this is the stress okay okay yeah so yeah one thing i i'm yet to come at is now that these are the non zero components what we see here is 
that epsilon y z or y z y is equal to b by four pi times cos theta by r. Now there is a cos theta term, which means that the value changes with theta, and that is, it is not radially symmetric. Okay, but a dislocation line is a line, so shouldn't you? Uh, particularly in the case of a screw dislocation, it is a line. If you look at it for the purpose of Volta construction, we may say that there is a cut at one point. But in real, we do not say that this is where the cut is. This is a dislocation line, and it is same all across, and the construction is same all across. So there is no starting point. And in that sense, there should have been a radial symmetry. So where are we? What are we missing here? Similarly, we can look at the stresses. We look at it and we see that it is a function of cos theta, and therefore it is not radially symmetry. In fact, this is how the relation. Uh, when you plot this epsilon y z, so this is epsilon x z or sigma x z, and this is epsilon y z or sigma y z. This is how it looks like. You can clearly see this is not symmetric, and the Clue or the key answer lies in the fact that this we uh, this is a cylindrical quantity, but we have been using Cartesian coordinate x y z, which is more suitable for a rectangular kind of object. Therefore, what we need is to translate everything into cylindrical coordinates, and which is what is done over here. So, when you translate it to cylindrical coordinate, we have only these two quantities as non-zero. E theta z is equal to E z theta, which is equal to b by four pi r, and similarly sigma theta z and sigma z theta, and you can clearly see now it has radial symmetry. So our assertion or our assumption understanding is right. There should be radial symmetry, but for that we need appropriate coordinates, and that appropriate coordinate is the cylindrical coordinate. So in here now you can see this is what we have here is epsilon theta z or sigma theta z, and we do really get a radial symmetry for this. So this is the overall stress field and strain field for screw dislocation. Now we will look at the stress and strain field around edge dislocation. So for uh, edge dislocation, you would see that the components which are non-zero are very different from the components which were non-zero in the screw dislocations. So here are the we are again, as I mentioned earlier, we are not going to go through the derivation, and those interested can look for a paper by SLB which will describe this derivation. So here are the non-zero components: sigma x x. Is given by this relation. Sigma y y is given by this relation. Sigma x y is given by this relation, and sigma z z is basically uh, given by the x and y combination of x and y with a factor of nu, and therefore it turns out to be this. And when you look at the stress tensor, these are the five quantities which are non-zero. And what you notice is that it is actually inverse, absolutely inverse of the stress tensor that you obtain for screw dislocation. And uh, same can be said about the strain tensor. So if we look at the strain tensor, if we had to write down the strain tensor for the edge dislocation, it will be very similar to this. So these are the non-zero components for the strain. Now, if you want, if you wanted to plot how the sigma x x varies along x and y axis, and here 
this doesn't have a cylindrical symmetry so we need not worry about cylindrical coordinates and uh, in that case if you want to if you wanted to draw the variation of stress strain so xx basically the normal stresses are acting along x and uh, if we draw it like this where let's say the edge dislocation is somewhere like this we know that in this particular case on the we have already looked at it in a uh, in just one glance that there should be compressive stresses over here so we will put it as the minus sign and there should be tensile stresses which we will put as positive sign and if you plotted the contours it would look something like this However, the fact is that all the plane on above this middle line or this uh, line dividing the extra or from where the extra half plane arises would have compressive strains and compressive stresses and everything below this will have tensile stresses. If you look at the tensor, if you look at the sigma yy, which is like this, it is a little bit more complicated than this and it will look like So this is sigma xx, this is sigma yy. This is reflux, roughly how uh, the major component would look like, but this is not all, there is more to it. So it would have, if you draw 45 degree line, So along this 45 degree line, you would see that there are some smaller lobes. And when we, when I, we are drawing the lines, you remember that it is a contour line, meaning those of constant stresses. Now here, you would happen to have, if this is, uh, so this would be compressive. So basically in this direction, you will have compressive and this one will also be compressive and this one will also be compressive. Well, this one will be tensile, well, this one will be tensile, and this one will be tensile. The third stress that we have is the sigma xy. So for the sake of completion, let's also look at this one. It will, it happens to be similar to the yy, only that it is rotated by 90 degrees. And remember that this is shear stress, not the normal stresses like sigma xx and sigma yy. So this is, these are called dumbbell type of structure or feature. So it has a dumbbell kind of distribution. And here again, we will have smaller dumbbells. So whatever is the stress direction over here, you would see shear stress direction in this particular case. So this will be clockwise. So this one, let's say this one, it represents the clockwise shear. So this one will be the anti-clockwise. And if this is clockwise, this one is also clockwise, and this one is also clockwise, and this is anti-clockwise, then this is also anti-clockwise and anti-clockwise. And this is, uh, these equations are very easy to plot in MATLAB, and it is shown over here. So this is the MATLAB plot, which is shown. So this, you can clearly see, this is the compressive stresses, which are reddish, and the bluish one are the tensile. So if you go closer and closer to the dislocation, there are lines that side looking dark, otherwise it would have become redder and redder. And similarly over here, over here you have the reddish one, which is compressive and the blue ones are the tensile.
So these three lobes are tensile. So here, everything on the down bottom plane is tensile. And here, the shear stresses, the negative ones are shown by blue. So these three lobes are blue and the positive ones are shown by green lobes, which are over here. And since you have sigma xx, sigma yy, so this is sigma xx, this is sigma yy, and this is sigma zz. Therefore, you can also plot the hydrostatic stress which would look like this. So again, this is where your dislocation is. And overall, you see that there is a compressive hydrostatic stress on the upper side and tensile hydrostatic stress on the bottom side. So that is the nature of things. So now we have sigma xx, sigma yy, and this was xy, sorry about this error. This is shear stress sigma xy. And we see that overall we have three different zones uh, which can be divided or obtained by making 45 degree lines like we drew over here, or basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different zones. So these different eight different zones can be shown to have different stresses acting on them. So now we know that everything on the positive side in the X direction, it will be compressive. So we can draw it like this. and everything on below this line. So here is your edge dislocation. Uh, and we have drawn eight different zones where each of these zones are 45 degrees apart. And you would see that in one particular zone, you will have one constant stress state. Although the magnitude may vary, but the signs would not vary. So this is all compressive. And over here, we have all tensile. Now looking at the sigma yy, the normal stresses, we know that these two have the compressive and this one, these two also happen to be compressive while these two are tensile and so are these two. So we can accordingly draw like that. And then this is the tensile. So if these, if these are tensile and so are these two. So these are the eight different uh, zones and now we have identified the uh, normal stresses on all of them. Now we can also identify the shear stresses onto them. So we said that this one is, these two are the clockwise. So let's put it like this. Clockwise on the X direction. And so that would mean anti-clockwise in the Y surface. So these two have to be opposite so as to balance. Otherwise, you can imagine that the object would start rotating, which we know is not supposed to happen. Therefore, these two must be equal and opposite in sense. And uh, 
whatever we have, have over here would be the same over here. So this and this would be same. And it will be the very opposite in these two and in these two. So this is how the stress state around edge dislocation looks like because we have the sigma xx, sigma yy and the sigma xy. So overall the stress state around the edge dislocation would look something like this. And uh, that, so now we have, with that now we have the, stress state around edge dislocation as well as the stress state around uh, screw dislocation. So we will conclude the stress state up over here and we will come back and use this stress relations to calculate the energy of the dislocations. Thank you.